we're here to talk, we're, we're here to have a, a multifaceted discussion around uh, Open 19, what it means to certain industries. Um, uh, up here represents some of the game changers when it comes to uh, the adoption of Open 19, the manufacturing of Open 19, the end user capabilities of Open 19, um, and, and even you know, on, the, on the wireless side, uh, what that means to telcos. So many, many questions. Um, uh, I, I purposely, I do not like scripted questions with panel discussions. I like it to be raw. Uh, and unfiltered, so uh, I did not ask these guys to meet before now, so I could ask them the tough questions, uh, and you're going to get you're going to get raw uh, stream of consciousness type answers from these guys. So it should be really interesting. Um, before we jump into the questions, I'd like each one of them to just quickly identify themselves, introduce themselves, talk about what where they are, where they've been, what they're doing. Start with Ehab. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I'm Ihab Tarazi. I'm the CTO at Packet. You heard from Tao just a little while ago. He's part of my team too. Um, before that, I was the CTO at Aquanex, and before that, I was VP of Engineering at Verizon. So I've always been in networking, data center, cloud, and I'm really looking forward to calls, questions. We'll see. Chris. Yeah, I'm Chris Winslow. I'm a general manager of our cloud and data center business at Flex. I talked about earlier in the presentation. Uh, we've been one of the early innovators around Open 19, along with other open architectures for, for the cloud, as well as have a significant uh, infrastructure business for telecom. So we're excited about the convergence between the telecom and, uh, and the cloud business, and they're investing heavily. Aaron. Thanks, Chris. My name's Aaron Hinkle. I'm a systems architect at Sprint in the R&D organization. I've been working on how 5G, our Curiosity IoT platform, and what it means for edge compute, and how that all converges as we start deploying those new services. Yeah, you guys don't need to use Yuval. Yeah, Everyone is. knows Yuval. Uh, no, go ahead, really. <laughs> I'm Yuval, I'm a part of the data center team at LinkedIn. Before that, I spent a few years at Facebook and at Cisco. Awesome. So what I thought we would do is, um, about four years ago, uh, I, heard, I heard this term, um, mud to cloud. I'm going to just modify it a bit and say mud to edge. So we're going to walk you through the various layers of what it takes to go create this and why Open 19 is so strategic. So at the, at the lowest layers of what it means to deploy infrastructure, and when we think about infrastructure, there's of course the physical infrastructure and the logical infrastructure, right? There's the manipulation of atoms, and then there's the manipulation of bits. And so we're going to start with the manipulation of atoms. So my first question is going to be to Chris, who kind of represents the the uh, the manufacturing side of this. And um, you know, my my question to you, Chris. And again, if you have questions here, I would really like this to be a real time discussion between the audience and the panelists. So, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand. Uh, it doesn't matter. We don't need to hold the questions till the end. Um, if you have a thought or a comment or you disagree or agree violently with something one of the panelists says, then then let's have the conversation about it. Um, but my first question to Chris is, F Flex has gone through somewhat of a, a rebranding, right, from Flextronics to Flex. You've gone through sort of um, some, some market maturity conversations internally. Why did you get into the Open 19 game? What was interesting for you? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So I'd say there's a, uh, there's a couple of different uh, reasons for it. One is... Um, we believed in Yuval's vision about transforming the architecture to be able to support the edge. Um, I'd say the other big reason for us is, is we have an enormous telecom infrastructure business. We support uh, all of the major OEMs around the world in both design and manufacturing for the core infrastructure uh, for every telecom network essentially in the world. Um, that's from wireless to wireline to everything in between. What we see is an, probably the biggest transformational change that'll happen from an infrastructure perspective that's happened probably in 50 years. Um, we think every carrier will end up re-architecting their network over the next 10 or 20 years. We think the cloud will become sort of amorphous with the rest of the carrier networks. Uh, we think an entire new industries will be created by the advent of 5G. 
And so for us, um, it's important for us to shift from being reactive to being proactive. Because to be honest, I don't know who the major players are gonna be 10 years from now. Um, the people today that are maybe sitting in this audience or watching us on the stream or whatever, may be concocting the next great thing. And for us, we need to be investing in the, the technologies that we believe are gonna transform the industry. And we believe in, incredibly strongly around the edge, and we saw Open 19 as a way to attack the edge. Um, Ehab, let me, uh, let me ask a follow-up question to that. Um, for those that weren't here during Tao's presentation or those that don't know what Packet does, you know, Packet has a pretty opinionated view of the service delivery model for the edge, right? And, 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 and technologies like Open 19, I think, um, offer you some unique opportunities, but also present some pretty unique challenges. Um, from, a, from a systems management standpoint, when you have to orchestrate thousands and thousands and thousands of racks across massively decentralized footprint, or core infrastructure for that matter, what was interesting about Open19 for you and, and Packet as you guys are looking at how you scale your Open19 business? Yeah, actually, that's a very good question. That's probably the best way to talk about Open19 and the Edge. A lot of people are still talking about it. Do you want this server or do you want that? And what kind of capacity you want? But the reality is what's happened is on the hardware side, the innovation has really exploded. I mean, there's lots of very innovative hardware companies here in this place and on the web that need a delivery model for everything. And we're not just talking about servers anymore, we're talking about SSDs, we're talking about uh, uh, GPUs, FPGAs, so, and each one of them, there's only not three vendors, maybe a hundred of them who wanna get the equipment out. Then on the software side, there's probably a hundred platforms that need to be delivered. So to try to think that the world is just a server and the whole discussion is about, is it 19 inch or 23 inch? misses the entire point of what I would say 5G, which is probably a trillion dollar business. The idea is to be able to package all of that enormous complexity in a way that operations people can implement. From my days at Verizon, I mean, we had 200,000 people, so you can imagine what it takes. There's nothing out there that enables the operational model for this future world today. And I think what you've all and the team have done here is probably the most innovative thing to bring that to do it. So I really believe the operational model is probably the biggest one because people impact the cost and the time frames and the SLAs more than anything else. So I said I was gonna ask, thank you for that. And just one other question to you and then I'm gonna bring it over to Aaron here at Sprint. But I said I was gonna ask hard, controversial questions. Um, you were the CTO of Equinix. You had a big hand in Equinix joining Open Compute because I was one of the people recruiting you. What does Open 19 do for you that OCP maybe could be doing in the future or has missed on? What is the, what is the Open 19 opportunity that fills any gaps that might exist? Yeah, I mean, when we were at Equinix, we were supporters of OCP also. And I personally was part of TIP. I was on the leadership team move, you know, with one of the different teams with Hans Jorgen. So, I really don't think it's an either or. Right. I think similar to IP networks, there's a core and an edge. Yeah. I think OCP and TIP are tackling some major issues, but I feel like this piece has not been addressed yet there. I think OCP may be trying to create an edge project, and for full disclosure, we're also supportive of OCP, um, but I think usually in technology, you have multiple platforms show up to add its missing gaps. So. so um, when Ehab, Aaron, talked about the service delivery model, um, it was interesting to hear him talk about sort of the complexities associated. And what I gathered from that was there's, a, there's kind of a truck roll thing. How does the standard truck roll um, manifest itself for you as a consumer? You publicly have announced that you're working with Packet. Um, uh, you've also announced some, some base station provider relationships. When you think about how you consume this next generation uh, 5G architecture, 
uh, and the infrastructure that goes with it, so much of that has been virtualized. It's, it's, the, it's, it's you know, we've kind of done the analog to digital shift all over again uh, on the wireless side of the network. What is interesting for you about Open19 in context of how Sprint thinks about the procurement of rolling out its next generation networks? Open19 gives flexibility. So at least at Sprint, it takes a minimum of two years to get a new service out into production. And a good year of that is just getting the hardware into place, getting the cabling, getting the, all of the supply chain to get all of the um, equipment to the facility itself. By showing what Yuval has done by putting the chassis in place that are generic enough so anybody's equipment can slip into it as a brick, changes how we do our economic model. Because what it then enables us to do is to inexpensively outfit the data center and then as we need it, very quickly slot in servers. So our time to market goes from two years down to one year or less. By having Packet be there as well, then we can take it a step further because now instead of having to buy the server itself, we can move from a CapEx to an OpEx model and we can um, go to them uh, to Packet and have, okay, I just need an, another virtual machine spun up. Telco space has gone from purpose-built equipment to virtual machines and now we're in the transition to containers. And at the same time, the application layer is being restructured where you have a stateless um, user plane that's being, where most of the bits are being moved for the wireless network that's being pushed further out and where the control plane is being held back in and that's where your state is happening. And when you start looking at a telco and what's been going on, we're deploying massive MIMO antennas now. So instead of per cell sector on a tower doing gigabit download speeds with what our 2.5 gigahertz um, spectrum does today, we're gonna be able to get 8X on that per cell sector today. And in January, we're gonna start rolling out our next radio for 5G, which is going to triple that again. Now, these are all theoretical speeds, but you're talking one to two orders of magnitude in backhaul. When you go back to regional data centers where we'd have to come back to, it means I now need two orders of magnitude more firewalls in our major data centers, more compute, more layer three, more layer two. So now this is gonna push all of that out to the edge and what that would mean in terms of cost structure and speed of delivery. Because 5G is gonna be bringing a heavyweight and lightweight AI clients. They're gonna be more um, sensitive in terms of latency and in terms of SLAs, which is gonna require us to be at the edge. And because edge is more than the 30 data centers we have now, now we're looking at what happens when we go out to 100 data centers and then go out to the highest number of towers that are pushing the most amount of traffic. But we don't know where the usage is gonna be, so we're not sure where to, uh, to lay and compute. And what you've all said, most of the expense is in that actual brick itself. So if we can deploy the everything but the brick, then as the business need happens, we can move the equipment there as needed very, very quickly. So you've all, um, you heard Aaron talk about 5G and sort of what's happening there and the, the need for the, the, the move from 30 data centers to 100 plus data centers. You've been You've been on record as saying the internet needs, it's broken, needs to be fixed. I, I've read that, I, I've, I've read that before. Um, what does 5G do for, so with a LinkedIn hat, what, what does 5G do for LinkedIn on, on the mobile side of the equation, but, but with an Open19 hat, what does 5G do for the greater industry who's thinking about this massively decentralized world? Mm -hmm. Yes, so if, if you look at LinkedIn, LinkedIn's business is actually our users. And, uh, and our, our uh, members, which are actually coming into our platform and, and sharing their technology, sharing their ideas, sharing their concepts. Uh, the user experience for our perspective is, is the primary uh, uh, tool to get engagement. And for us to be at the edge and be able to actually serve our, our end users much, much faster is priceless. We cannot really measure what's the impact directly, but we definitely see a significant impact in regions that we have a much better access to the users and the page pop up in, in milliseconds versus seconds, there's definitely much higher level of engagement. So from a LinkedIn perspective, having edge solutions is, is a must and it's gonna get even more critical for us because our app is becoming more and more rich. It has higher level of content, it has more high bandwidth through demanding content and we'll need to be close to the end user to be able to give it the solution. And we are, we are deploying multiple projects to actually address that need in different markets and in different platforms. If you go to the Open19 side, he said, 
Okay, so how's Open 19 related to that? So Open 19 initially did not start for the edge. It started for optimizing our data center, but because LinkedIn has a relatively distributed footprint and very diverse footprint, which is very, very similar to the future generation of the edge, the platform actually came out to be almost a perfect match for the edge. We might have to do tuning here and tuning there, and that's the beauty of having a community to do that. But we build it in a way that it can fit anywhere. And if you have uh, liquid cooling or you have air cooling, or if you are sitting at the base of a cell tower in the local office or deep in your network, you're gonna have exactly the same experience and exactly the same way to use the same hardware. And the operational model becomes very simplistic. Now for us, it's like we have all those stages in our environment. We have large data centers. We have the point of presence where we're actually closer to the customer. And now we're probably gonna get even closer to the customer when the edge technology is going maturing. For us, having the same servers, the same management system, the same uh, control system for all those layers is amazing because it simplifies our operations in a dramatic way. And, and this is to anybody at the panel. What, what does it mean when Sprint could do network handoff to LinkedIn or Sprint could do network handoff to uh, a backbone that, say, Packet is building? Um, what, what, is that, what, is that, what does that mean to you guys? Who wants to take that? I'll take that one. When you start looking at the backhaul requirements and what you have to do from the cell tower, most, cell, most operators to cell towers are just now upgrading to gigabit backhaul. When you start looking at the massive volumes of data and tonnage that's gonna be required to get back from the tower to the core network and from there all the way back deep in the network, it's cost prohibitive for an operator to be beefing up all the towers. At the same time, 5G is in a much higher frequency spectrum, which means you're gonna go from 40,000 towers to 400,000 towers. And at that point, being able to put 100 gig E to every one of a half million towers is cost prohibitive. So the other way of uh, getting around the oversubscription problem is bring the application out to the edge with the core. And when you do that, then you don't have to backhaul. Then the end user experience improves dramatically and the economics for everybody involved change dramatically. Yeah, I would add that most of what we talk about today with the network, even when most 90% of what people say about 5G is really not, is really still yesterday's 4G. 5G is completely different. It's the first time that the network is cloud native. So this is the first time that there's a network service that is cloud native from the grounds up as a cloud. You need cloud resources to deploy cloud native applications. So it's not a debate. You have to have massive amount of compute at the edge for 5G to work. And that's gonna happen. It's just, I think we're still at a very early stage that people are debating it. But I would say most of the debate still is something that looks like 4G that people are debating, not truly 5G. I'll add to that, Paul. I think the, the one, we, we have an opportunity to actually reinvent stuff once every decade or two. This is the cycle where we actually need to reinvent stuff at the edge because a lot of the things that we're talking about just did not exist before. Doing exchange, which is 500 miles away from your cell tower, is useless <laughs> in most cases and will not work, right? So one of the areas of the edge that is actually affecting us as, as app operators is that I want to be able to actually have a person with a Sprint phone next to an AT&T phone have exactly the same experience and interact between them through an exchange which is local. And that exchange needs to be invented, it's not there. The whole backhauling aspect of it, you can't backhaul 10,000 HD cameras into your cloud. You cannot, it's just not possible. And even if you try to do it, it's gonna be so expensive that you're gonna basically turn off all the cameras. So all those things has to play into a point where we actually reinvent that area of the network, that area of the, of the services delivery, and we build around an environment where we create an edge cloud, and you can call it edge cloud, and there's probably seven different names for that edge cloud, but it all means one thing. It means low latency, close to the end user servers, which will operate cross a service provider, cross cellular provider. So I, if I have a car and I'm driving it on an AT&T network, it should behave exactly the same as if I'm running it on a Sprint network. There's no way the AT&T car will stop faster than Sprint. Just no way, right? It's not gonna work. So that's why we have to invent these things 
I think what we did with Open19 is to enable the platform to say, okay, now we can build it, right? Now we can evolve it really, really fast and change the models that we have and build a network exchange like that Equinix did about 10 years ago at the edge and enable people to exchange closely the traffic that they care about in exchanging in a close proximity. Not everything we care about, right? If we have a, a sensor for temperature in the middle of Chicago, it does not need to be mission critical. It can go to the cloud. But if a car, two cars ahead of you is actually saying, I'm gonna crash to the car in front of me, be ready, it's really, really critical to actually have the other car know about this, and it doesn't really matter on which network you're running. Yep. Piggybacking on that, everybody hears about autonomous robots, autonomous drones, autonomous cars, and everybody thinks they're a decade off. You're going to see the first autonomic ro uh, autonomous robots um, in terms of guard dogs in January in production. You're going to see the first autonomous cars doing drive routes in the U.S. in Q1 of next year. This is a reality. It's coming. Associated with that, Yuval was mentioning the video and what was going on. There's a lot more involved than just a little bit of video streams. The AI associated with making that car be able to see the traffic lights and what's going on, to understand what's around the car. You don't want the car to run over a little girl on a bicycle because the car didn't see it. So now we have to bring contextual awareness to the car. How do we do that? The car only sees from the car perspective. The autonomous dog only sees from the dog's perspective. So in that context, now we have to go from the network side and help provide that contextual awareness. But that means three-dimensional um, radar. That means video feeds on every traffic light. That means um, video feeds on every light pole along the way so that we can inform all these autonomous vehicles, there's a little girl on a bicycle close by. Mr. Autonomous um, Vehicle, maybe you should slow down a little bit in case she suddenly veers in front of you. All that requires an inordinate amount of computing power and bandwidth if you're going to pipeline all that back to the network. So now all that AI has to be done at the edge because it's too much raw data. So if you're going to do all that processing with AI at the edge, and we're already seeing companies pop up such as Swim AI and other AI companies to do that processing at the edge, that's where it's going to happen. And all of that is going to feed into making this autonomous world happen. And if anybody thinks there's no use case for it, Go to the, lo uh, the local nursing home and uh, retiree home. You don't want your 90-year-old grandma driving a car, but she still wants her autonomy. So that autonomous car is going to give it to her. To enable that to happen, we need to have that compute at the edge because the backhaul just can't do it. Let me, uh, that's awesome. Um, let me ask the audience, audience participation. Raise your hand if you think 5G is between Q1 and Q2 of next year? Who thinks it's here? Couple people. Who, who thinks it's 2019 uh, at all? Who thinks it's 2020? A Aaron shared with me, it's, it, you're deploying out your first 5G capable technology in Q1 next year. Correct. It's here, guys. It's, uh, it's here. We're, we're doing pilots with drone companies uh, but, that are that are doing line of sight, you know, line of sight today. But 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 the but the government is voting on beyond line of sight autonomous drones uh, at the end of this year. You're you're going to see these applications here next next year, early next year. And and what I like to say uh, is, uh, and I'm borrowing this from a friend of mine. Uh, but if you're not at the dinner table, you're on the dinner table. These use cases are here now present and being developed as we speak. So with that, I want to turn it back over to Chris. Uh, and I have toured the Austin Flex facility. Flex actually is the, the manufacturer of the Vapor Tech, as you saw. Um, what implications, Chris, exist for the base stations? From a, from a, from a mud to cloud, right, or mud to edge, there's, there's, there's physical stuff that gets built. There's radios that get built. There's, there's ASICs that get built. There's antennas that get built. There's, right, there's lots of hardware. And you build a lot of that stuff. Yep. What implications exist for the next generation hardware for Open19 when, when thinking about what a virtualized radio access network looks like or a virtualized evolved packet core? When yep. you build that physical stuff, what, what opportunities are there for Open19 in that world? Yeah, so what we're seeing today, particularly uh, both the big incumbent carriers as well as uh, lots of new players, I mean, 
Um, you know, there's players in Japan because there's a different system in Japan where you don't have to you don't have to auction you know frequency. They just award it to you. Now there's all kind of new players that were never in the, the, the networking business before and now becoming carriers. The view then from both incumbents as well as the new players is I want to follow the script of disaggregation. I want to use the same advantages that have happened to create the cloud uh, to build my network, which means how much more open source can I use that's going to be reliable and I control? for the reasons that were mentioned around how quick can I deploy new mm. services. Mm. Um, so now instead of a monolithic uh, cellular system with base stations and, and single vendor proprietary connections to antennas that are tuned to this, it's now kind of disaggregate my antennas from, from, my, from my base stations, from my core systems, can I do more of it with, with open source, open stack systems that I can control that allow me then to put together a system to the point made about how fast can I go deploy new services? Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and you've mentioned too, it's like 4G, 5G is not just an extension of 4G. It's not just this is a faster version of 4G. It's going to create entirely new industries that people haven't even really fathomed yet. Some of them have been anticipated and are going to start rolling out. Some of them people haven't even created yet. So this disaggregation, the allowance of different uh, building blocks being put together to, to facilitate those is going to be key. And I think things like Open 19 that allow multi-vendor, multi-system, ease of use, ease of installation, ease of service are going to be critical to how fast you can expand this. Um. Yeah, I, I think that's right. We've, we've, got, we've got three minutes left. Um, I do have more questions, but I want to just make yeah, sure. let's get the audience. Yeah, I would like to make sure that we answer any audience questions. Does it, any, anybody have a, just raise your hand if you have a comment or a question uh, about this. Get, we can get Tao back up here. He, no questions. Um, oh, over to the right. There's one there. Oh, perfect. Yes, please. Okay, the question was, how soon do we see the MNOs opening up their networks to the, to the edge providers? Um, I'm, gonna let, I'm gonna let Aaron and Ehab take that one. Who wants to go first? In less than a year. Yeah, I would, I would say some of them are already open. I, d I just don't think people are not talking about that anymore because I'll give you the best way to think about it. The, What's happening at the edge and all these people using, let's say, factories, offices, people are using AWS IoT or Azure IoT, we're using products from VMware. The game has really changed. Yeah. It's the opposite now. Now the, the, any service provider is saying, how do I get to all these clouds because all my customers are using them and I'm locked out of it. It's no longer, you know, I'm not sure if I open it. Now it's more like, my God, how do I get the cloud to come in? Otherwise, I'll lose my customers. So all of them are opening up at different degrees as fast as possible with different architectures. I don't think we'll be talking about this topic a year from now. One of the other aspects that comes into play here, one of the reasons why with our Curiosity IoT platform we went to pack it is it allows us to auto scale. So it's the first time that we've gone fully into the virtualization space and as we're moving towards the cloud native container space. We, when we started running the numbers and doing the testing, what we discovered is that the minute we get away from the purpose built, where I'd have to build five years of capacity up front and it sat idle 99% of the time, if I had the ability to scale out when I needed it, because for a telco provider today, a mobile operator, you have two busy days of the year you, you scale for. Mother's Day and Christmas, because everybody calls mom. It's just, that's the reality. Triple the traffic on those two days of the year, so you build up your capacity for that. If I have the ability to bring up my infrastructure just one week earlier for those two days, and then I can scale it back down, it saves 30% of my CapEx on hardware alone. Yeah, I, and you can't I, ignore that. I mean, and for anybody in the audience, if you haven't seen the announcement at Mobile World Congress, for what Sprint announced, Curiosity, I will just give them a plug. It's definitely one of the most creative IoT, and you could see that to make IoT work for a carrier, 
not only you have to work with the cloud providers, but they're also involved with ARM. I know some of the ARM players are here. You really have to bring the analytics all the way down to the CPU to pull the data, to do something with it and massage it. This is kind of what the world looks like. That announcement is probably, in my view, one of the first two 5G that is not fixed wireless that we see a lot of. Well, you know, we also realized on that is the minute we brought that auto scaling capability with compute there, we actually needed the hyperscalers to come in with us and we're trying to figure out how to do that. Bringing Packet closer to the edge with us at the same time getting Microsoft with Azure and AWS closer to us as well. Because if it's good for us, it's good for the application provider as well. Yep. Because at the end of the day, the experience improves if they're co-located with our core. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't agree more, uh, but I'm not a panelist, so I'm gonna reserve my comments. Uh, uh, I've got so many questions, and we did just reclaim 12 minutes, so I hope that that was done on purpose and we should keep going, uh, otherwise someone come pull us off stage. Um, Ehab mentioned ARM, uh, and you've all, again, both Open 19 and LinkedIn, um, and, and I, I liked the, I liked the, it's not, it's not this or that, right? In context of OCP versus Open 19, it can be this and that. Um, moving that sort of down a layer to sort of silicon, uh, so many edge native applications are gonna be built on different sort of silicon. How, how do you think, in context of Open 19, how, how do you think about the, the multi-tiered silicon solutions that get enabled for things like end user termination and you know, where middleware, what middleware is doing, what the backend database is doing, what, what H.264 might be doing right on the video side? Uh, let me open that up to the panel. Yeah, I think from a compute engine perspective, there's clearly a single de facto dominant player right now. And th so, in my opinion, what you, you will see in the next five years is probably a split of the market between the x86 with all its variances. Hopefully, we'll get a, a multiple variance on that uh, beyond the Intel side and an ARM environment. Uh, the, rest, the rest of the risk-based uh, CPUs, I think, f at least from an app uh, operator side, it's extremely difficult for us to go to our software people and say, change your environment altogether. And, and I think our rule of thumb of that is that to enable a new CPU technology that will impact thousands of software engineers in our environment, we need half the price, twice the performance. If it doesn't come into play, the, the, that is a very, very difficult sell for us to our software people because our software people do not want to make changes. So we are pursuing all the directions and we are pursuing all the CPUs. I think what we did and we're still working on with the, the partners we have on the Open 19 hardware is to create a portfolio that will address all the needs. Mm. And if I, need, if I want to be on an AMD platform, I will have at least one or two or three suppliers that will deliver a server to it. But if I need next to this AMD platform a super duper Skylake or, or next to it which has terabytes of memories on it, I can still do that because it's actually coexists with me. And, and if you look at the way we build, build racks, our racks are not built in a homogeneous way. We, di we diverse them. We put multiple types of servers in them for reasons of uh, stability and, and uptime and, and reliability. But for us to switch into a different CPU is an easy path as long as we can not impact on our software team. Um, you know, as, as the gentleman in the green asked the question, as you've all just answered here, one of the reoccurring themes, and, and Ehab even brought it up a little earlier, one of the reoccurring themes that I think we're, we're all hearing a lot about is this networking thing, right? Uh, out, out, of, out of the OCP telco working group came TIP. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, and the, we know, you know, with the, with the board hat on of, of Open19, we know that there are multiple sort of switch silicon companies and and mm -hmm. platform companies that uh, are opinionated on the networking stack. And this is a question very much to anybody on the panel as, as much as it is to anybody in the audience. Should Open19 take a view on open networking? We've talked about open source and, and, and the fact that we need sort of these control planes and data planes to be open um, and, and democratized. Should Open19 take a view on what open networking could look like for peering at the edge, how EPCs run at the edge, 
What, what's, what's the, what are the thoughts? Anybody so, out there? Yes. <laughs> and the, the answer is simple. Just like what you had brought up earlier in terms of you want the nice big red easy button that VMware provided in the virtualization world. The reality is when you move to the edge and you move to a public cloud, you have to be able to do a full SDN deployment as an overlay network in a secure way, as well as do a whole application. So now the orchestration from the networking all the way through the physical up to the application is now required to have that big red easy button so you can stitch it together quickly. Before in the data center, we've never had to think about all these layers from the application all the way down to the physical wire. Unfortunately now, especially we go to the edge and you're talking about one to two orders of magnitude number of data center increases, most of these are lights out data center. It's all gonna be logical, it's all software defined. And it has to be done easy because there's not so many smart people like in this room out there managing these networks. So it has to be simple so that the, the lowest level engineer doing support can put it up, troubleshoot it, and support it. Yeah, we're uh, seeing the same thing. I, yeah. I was just gonna say, it, um, it's kind of amazing how fast some of these cycles work now, right? So it was not very long ago where a lot of these conversations are all around general purpose computing, general purpose uh, networking, where the software stack was gonna solve all the problems. It was gonna solve your economics problems, it was gonna solve your flexibility problems. What a lot of, I think, a lot of the applications, to your point, that have been made, looked at now is that I, I can't actually do it all in software. I, I can't actually get the speed. I can't get their performance. So we're already working with a number of uh, silicon players in the networking side. Some announced, some in stealth mode, um, that are all trying to do the same thing, which is push more functionality out to the edge for routing and switching. Um, and start to make more programmable silicon as opposed to relying upon OS stacks to be able to go do that. And I think we're gonna see that as the trend in, in the age of silicon is back, right? In my opinion, that, that you're gonna see a lot more specialized silicon, not just on the compute side, but also the networking side, on the, on the storage side and other areas where the only way you're gonna be able to keep up with the line speeds, keep up with 5G wireless speeds, keep up with the new applications, you're gonna to have to push more into silicon, which means the open architectures are now, how do I go deploy different silicon in different environments as opposed to everything open has to do with my software stack? So, uh, great answer. Um, again, show of hands. Uh, who here would be interested in collaborating around a networking project for Open19? Raise your hand. Fair, a fair number of you. All right. If you're interested, come talk to Yuval and Chris and, and myself, and, I, and, and then I'm going to challenge Chris. If there's if there's critical mass here, you willing to go design it and build it for him? Yeah, we'd love to build the, We'd love to help build the ecosystem. I and mean, we're not a silicon company. We're a neighbor for silicon companies to get into applications. Yeah. But we have silicon guys that we're working with today that are asking us to help them come to market with a vehicle for their silicon, which requires somebody with an application that wants them. So we'd be glad to facilitate those conversations for that, sure and help build that. That's great. Uh, it, it, four minutes, four minutes, 30 seconds. Any, any other questions? Any, any other questions from the audience? Don't be shy. I know you guys all have opinions. Oh, perfect. Uh, so can we get her a mic, somebody? Uh, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Good panel, good discussion. Um, question is around uh, how do you see the infrastructure providers, particularly the IAAs, infrastructure as a service providers, such as Amazon, uh, playing their role in uh, the Open 19, Open Standard specification, particularly in the context of 5G? Thank you. So uh, the question, if I, if, if I understand it correctly, was what role do the infrastructure providers play the IAAS companies, the infrastructure as a service providers play in Open 19 in context of 5G. Is that right? Uh, anybody on the panel? Anybody want that? I mean, yeah. you've all, you're owned by a big CSP, right? <laughs> 5G <laughs> yeah. is a lot more software based than what you've previously seen. So you're starting to see smart radio heads now that you don't have a base station at the bottom with a remote radio head on top of the tower. 
you now have a radio head that's smart enough to do majority of the work. But then what happens when the CRAN solution goes out there is that a lot of the coordination and guts that used to be in a purpose-filled box now run as a virtual machine or as a container further back into the cloud. So in that regard, where does 5G work? Um, it comes down to just bigger, fatter, and closer to the edge in terms of compute. And the, infra, the IIS providers, like what we're doing with Packet, the reason to have them out there is it changes our economics. Because 5G and the high-end IoT infrastructure business is just in its nascency. It's just starting to grow. So we don't know where to place the hardware yet. So having an Open19 infrastructure and having an infrastructure as a service provider like Packet be out there at the edge means when I need compute, I need to give them a couple days notice and they're slotting another server into place so that I can use it quickly. And then I can grow as the business, our business in the 5G space grows. Yeah, I would, I would say when you think of uh, 5G, if I can simplify it enormously, I would say it's a set of software platforms that virtualize everything we do in the network, EPC, P Gateway, IoT. So it's a whole bunch of software that are all cloud native, so they look like cloud. They want to use something like Kubernetes as a container engine. So if you think of 5G as hundreds of software, you know, different companies, that software is looking for hardware to deploy on. And I used to think the blocker in 5G was the wireless. I think the blocker now, I believe, is the cloud, which is the hardware. So while this may not be obvious, Open19 probably is the only solution out there today for something generic as what the wireless people would call neutral host cloud to allow for the deployment of all these software platforms. So, so I think this is really critical. To that one thing is like the Open 19 as a solution gives you the option to operate as a service in all the layers of the stack. So if you want to build a bare bone, bare metal service for people and lease slots, you can do that, which is the lowest level that some of the partners that we have actually do that. But you can start climbing up the stack and create an environment where we have diversified server environment even not yours, it can be somebody else's, and you're just gonna provision it, or you're just gonna monitor it, or you're just gonna create an abstraction layer for the uprighters. We're just seeing the emergence of uprighters who are coming with the 5G awareness. The apps are not mature, maturing yet. 5G awareness for uprighters requires from them to eliminate the need to think of what platform I'm writing on and the abstraction layer that is being created right now on top of the hardware abstraction layer that we created with Open19 enables you to play it anywhere in the stack in a fully abstracted way, especially when you're an app writer. Yeah, I, I, I'm reminded of something that, uh, that uh, my old boss once said. If it was easy, it'd be called easyware. And I, th <laughs> and I think, you know, to quote Shakespeare here, to get a little scholarly on you, uh, what is past is prologue we're seeing a shift back to supporting custom hardware configs, right? At the edge and, and in hardware, you have ASICs and GPUs and you know, different types of silicon for general purpose. Um, you've got FPGAs, you've got all sorts of, of can, different things. You want, I can add to that if you want. Yeah, really quick, we're, all, we're almost out of time, but go ahead. I'm trying to waste as much time so my presentation is short. <laughs> <laughs> No, so what I would say, I didn't get a chance to talk about the hardware piece, but we support ARM, AMD, Intel. We support multiple versions of GPUs. That's probably the biggest story here. Today, in my personal opinion, you have massive dependence on Intel for the cloud and massive dependence on Qualcomm for wireless. And if you think of the edge, this thing that's emerging, I would say ARM has been very successful. Most people are doing using ARM for the edge devices. So then what do the developers use? They're using all these devices with ARM. The cloud is Intel. So you have a huge difference of opinions here. So this is what where something modular like Open19 is required because some developers are saying, hey, I would like to put a place for, my, for the pipelining of my app that has to be core, core, ARM core based. Where is that? 
I challenge anybody to find that today outside somebody like Packet, you yep. know? Or somebody would say, I really need some very specialized hardware for CDN, which is no CDN-based hardware. So all these things are showing up and looking for a place to go. I was going to say the same thing for you, Yihab. Um, but uh, th thanks for the answer. You know, and I'll, I'll leave you guys with this. Um, hardware is hard, but it's harder to innovate in a bubble. It's, it's darn near impossible in today's modern internet to, to innovate in a bubble and, and own uh, all the intellectual requirements to go build the, these next generation capabilities that we're all expecting. I, I'm reminded, I was the, in a previous life, I was a cloud advisor at the Linux Foundation. And I remember Jim Zimlin sitting on stage, it was actually in Japan, it was in Tokyo, right before uh, he brought up Linus Torvalds. And, and this was back in 2010. And he said, the, 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 the smartest people in the room are not the smartest people in any one room anymore. It, it takes a ton. It used to, in the 90s, I did everything, right? When I was growing up in, in the data center world, we, we, you were the network engineer, you racked and stacked, you were the system admin, you did everything. Today, it's, it's impossible. It takes a village to go build out these types of ecosystems. Uh, clearly, you can see back here, you know, violent agreements about the soft winner faces, the, the paradigm shift, the network transformation. Um, and I, I, you know, I just want to thank all of you, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of the Open19 board and the panelists. Uh, we're excited to be building the future with you. You guys are all change agents. Uh, and uh, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank you guys for your intelligent questions and, and participation today. Thank you very much. Thank you.